Hello, my name is Nakai Rimmer. Welcome to this video where we look at U substitution. It's a series of videos, maybe three to four videos. And I want to start by going back and taking a look at what we already know how to integrate. Um, in this, in these next two slides, we'll have uh, constants K and C and oh, actually probably a capital A and I mean an A and a B. But anyway, here we go. So how do you integrate a constant? What function has k as its derivative? It's going to be kx plus any random constant c. Then from there, you stepped up your game and you were able to integrate x raised to a number. And the way you did that was the power rule, but, but, but in reverse. Instead of um, using the power rule, we use the reverse of that, where we add 1 to the exponent and divide by the same thing. Um, n actually is allowed to be any real number except for which one? What n would be bad? Having n equals negative 1 would be bad because you'd have division by 0. So anything but negative 1. And I like to call this the reverse power rule. Okay. What happens when n is negative 1? Well, a quick change on that, you'll see it. What is x to the negative 1? It's 1 over x. What function has 1 over x as its derivative? The natural log of x. Technically, we need absolute value bars in there. In case x can, is, ends up being negative, we can take the absolute value of it. All right, great. I guess next we should go to exponential. This is a special function. It has itself as its derivative and itself as its antiderivative. Well, plus a constant. What about any constant raised to the x? Not e to the x, but like a to the x, where a is some constant that's greater than 0. How do you integrate 2 to the x? Well, um, there's a way you could do it, but um, we, this is all review. So we, I'm assuming you know this already. Uh, if you need to review it, we can uh, spend time on it in lecture. But here we go. It is a to the x divided by the natural log of a plus a constant. Got to make sure that a is positive, though, because you're taking the natural log of it. Actually, greater than zero. Yeah, strictly greater than zero. All right, we're doing great. Let's move over to trig. How do you integrate the cosine of x? What function has cosine x as its derivative? Sine x plus a constant. What function has sine x as its derivative? Negative cosine x. What function has secant squared as its derivative? Tangent of x. All right, what about this guy? 1 over 1 plus x squared. That's somebody's derivative. Whose derivative is it? You got to go to the inverse trig for that one. That's arctans of x's derivative. Okay, one more on this slide here. Also in the inverse trig realm, arc sine of x. Okay, great. Now, on the next slide, what we're going to do is uh, take some of these and introduce a constant in the mix. I want you to know that I don't want you to have to do u substitution for such a for such a, a, a um, integrals that appear on this next slide. So I call it shortcuts, but it's just it's just using your intuition to find the antiderivative. What function has cosine kx as its derivative? We just saw the function has cosine of x as its derivative is sine of x. What does the k do? What does that multiplier k do? Without a substitution, I need you to be able to do this. So it should be kind of like before, sine of kx plus a constant. But that's not it, though. If you were to take the derivative of sine of kx plus a constant, you don't get cosine of kx. There'd be an extra factor of k that would come in from the chain rule. And so we need to cancel that out um, by putting a 1 over k out front. Now the k comes in from the chain rule. It gets canceled by the 1 over k, and you got how about the sine of kx? Well, we said negative cosine of x, so negative cosine of kx makes sense. Another 1 over k. How about e to the kx? It's going to be e to the kx, of course, right? That's how these exponentials work, but we're going to need a 1 over k. All right, how about 1 over ax plus b? a and b are constants. Okay. 
Just like with this one over K, every time there's a reciprocal here, the multiplier on X, let's do it here. The multiplier on X is A, so one over A, then it'll be like a natural log, absolute value of the denominator. All right, doing great. A um, couple more, these might not be as familiar um, in the in the inverse trig world. Like when X, when A was a one, this was arctan, X is derivative, but when A is not necessarily a one, what happens is just like with these guys here, there's a one over a multiplier, but actually we'll need a, a, a x over a on the inside. Okay, and then one more, the arc sine version of that doesn't have the one over a outside, and so we get this. We'll see an integral later that that looks like that. So the point of all this is to say, okay, you know how to integrate a bunch of functions. It's great, but you're really limited in what you can integrate. And so we want to open up the floodgates and be able to integrate many, many more functions. And in this first unit here, we go through five different techniques. And I'm considering U sub to be one of the techniques, although it's a, a topic that was previously co covered in a, a previous class. I'm making it our first topic for this class. And then we'll launch into the other techniques of integration by parts, integrating trig powers, trig substitution, partial fractions. We'll get to those. But I want to make sure we have a good understanding of use sub, and so I'm spending a whole unit, a whole a whole um, lesson on it. And I want this to be this next slide to be the concept slide. How does U substitution work? Why does it work the way it does? And how do you actually, you know, go about trying to figure it out? And so uh, this slide is a concept slide for you. You see, when you have a composite function, you want to take its derivative. You do the chain rule. When you have a composite function, you want to take its antiderivative, that's built for U substitution, that situation there. See, what we have here is a composite function, f of g of x, and it's multiplied by g prime of x, the derivative of that g of x function. How does this process work? Well, what you do in your first step is you let u equal g of x. Okay? g of x is the part of the integrand. Usually it's the inside function there, the function that is basically part of another function. Okay. After identifying what that should be, then the next step you should do is take its derivative. Okay. Taking the derivative of u equals g of x, that statement in step one, you get du dx is g prime of x. At first, you, I want you to do it this way, but after a while, you just say, oh, I just write du. I take the derivative on the right-hand side, and I remember to put a dx on there. Why are we going through this? Because we have to sub. You see, the rest of that, g prime of x dx, the rest of the integrand there is the what we consider to be the outside function. We have the inside function, and we have the outside function. U sub is built when one part of the integral has its derivative as another part of the integral. And so, uh, if not exactly its derivative, maybe some multiple of its derivative. All right, you take these steps one and two, put them together in step three, sub everything in, and you end up with a new integral. Instead of being f of g of x, no, now it's gonna be f of u. Instead of being g prime of x dx, now it's gonna be du. f of u, du is your new integral and the whole point is that's supposed to be a simpler integral okay should be a simpler integral that you can integrate okay all right great uh there's some technicalities of course we have to put them in there uh the function u needs to be differential so you can take the derivative and um the range of that function because um when you plug it uh, um composite function when you have a composite function with one guy plugged into another guy, you got to make sure the range um, of the inside function matches up with, you know, the domain of the outside function. Um, and then we need to make sure that, you know, we can integrate it. So technically what happens is the range, call it I of G, the range of G is I, and we need to make sure that, you know, F is continuous on that integral I. That's all technicalities we have to throw in there. Okay. All right. We're at nine, th nine minutes here, uh, halfway through almost to 10 minutes. Let's go ahead and stop now. That's the concept of U substitution. In the next video, we'll have a couple examples, walk you through the, uh, the process. If you have any questions, don't be afraid to ask. I'm here to help, and um, I will see you in the next video.